Cool. All right. So uh, welcome to class. Um, one thing I wanted to start with was uh, somebody asked me during office hours to put up uh, related reading for the material we've been discussing so far. So first of all, um, the first two chapters of the Bishop text, which is linked from the website, or will be shortly, uh, Anyway, should be linked from the website, uh, are good background, uh, good background reading. Uh, so they cover things like probability and uh, sort of the philosophy of why machine learning is a good thing. Uh, specifically for the topics that we're discussing uh, in the past few lectures, there's uh, the sections listed here uh, for things like nearest neighbor, least squares, linear classifiers, and then I'm going to be talking about naive Bayes today. All right? So. Um, with that, let's get back to uh, Bayes' rule. So at the end of class uh, last time, uh, I proved Bayes' rule. Uh, so that's basically, you know, it's all downhill from there. Uh, but uh, if you remember, it looked like this. So we have, um, oops. if I put my tablet upside down, it turns out to be much harder to write. Uh, here we go. So um, we have P of A given B is P of B given A, P of A divided by P of B, uh, so long as P of B isn't zero, right? So as long as you condition only on things that you might observe, you're doing machine learning. If you condition on things that are impossible to observe, you're doing philosophy, I don't know. Um, something else that isn't machine learning. So you never really have to worry about dividing by zero as long as you, you condition on only, only observables. Um, there's another form of Bayes' rule that is also useful. So if there's some other event C that's uh, in the picture but is just sort of background, you know it's happened, uh, you can put it in to every one of these terms and Bayes' rule still holds. So you get uh, P of A given B comma C uh, is equal to P of B given A comma C, uh, P of A comma C sorry, P of A given C um, over P of B given C, right? So we put B on the right-hand side of the conditioning bar uh, on every uh, single one of these terms on the, uh, both sides. Uh, and the proof for that is actually very similar to the proof that I gave uh, last time for Bayes' rule. I'm not gonna, uh, not gonna do it now. You should think about doing it for an exercise. Uh, but basically, what this allows you to do is, uh, before you were sort of implicitly conditioning on the universe of all possible events, well, if you know C happened, your universe has just effectively shrunk, and now you're explicitly saying, all right, C has happened, but I still want to do Bayes' rule on A and B. All right? So, there's another version of Bayes' rule that is uh, sometimes even more helpful than the uh, original version of Bayes' rule. It's called the sum version of Bayes' rule. Now, in the original, this is the original version of Bayes' rule. Um, a lot of times we'll know this thing and this thing, but this one we'll have some trouble figuring out, right? So, uh, so what do we do then? Well, suppose that. Um, Suppose that uh, this little event A, I'm going to uh, say A is equal to A1, right? And there's some mutually exclusive and exhaustive partition, a MEEP A, which is equal to A1 through uh, AN. And suppose that N is moderate. In other words, there's not uh, 23 gazillion different possibilities, but 10 or 1,000, right? So in this case, um, we can use the sum rule. Remember sum rule from last time. Sum rule I said was perhaps obvious but very useful. So we know sum over all of the uh, uh, partition elements of uh, P of AI given B. That's going to be equal to 1, right? Uh, because you know once you've conditioned on B, this is a mutually exclusive and exhaustive partition. One of them has to happen. So let's multiply both sides by uh, P of B. So this is sum over i, p of a i, oops, p of a i. Yes? When you say a is mutually exclusive and exhaustive, do you mean given b or in general? 
uh, it only has to be given B. So the question was, does it have to be mutually exclusive and, and exhaustive in general? Or can you throw out options that have become impossible once you observe B? And it's fine to throw out the options that have become impossible. Uh, OK, so we were in the middle of multiplying both sides by B, uh, P of B. Uh, and 1 times p of b is p of b, if I have my calculations correct. So what does this say? This says that p of b, the thing that we might have had trouble uh, computing, is equal to this, uh, to this sum, right? Uh, and then this thing here, we can rewrite, right? So um, as part of the derivation of Bayes' rule, we know that p of a given b, p of b, is the same as p of b given a, p of a. Right, so this is, uh, this whole thing here is equal to sum over i, uh, p of b given a i, p of a i, right? And uh, now, right, that's something that we've already, it's the same form as something we've already assumed that we know, right? So we know p of b given a and p of a, and we were just having difficulty with p of b. And so what we can do now is say that this whole thing is equal to, um, so let's just say this is a1 now, right? a1 and a1, that uh, p, of, p of a1 given b uh, is equal to uh, p of b given a1, p of a1, divided by the sum over i of p of b given a i, P of a i, right? So the idea is you take all of the possible things, you take the one that actually happened, right? And you say, what is its uh, value of this, uh, this expression? Then you compute the values of the expressions for all of the other things that could have happened, sum them together and normalize. Uh, and then you have your, uh, uh, then you have your, uh, your distribution, right? So you get P of a given B. It has to sum to 1, and so you just normalize so that it does, right? And so this is a nice trick, right? It means that you can just throw out the thing that you didn't know and renormalize so that it sums to 1, and everything's good, all right? Now, I should warn you, by the way, that there are a lot of places, both in this class and a lot of other classes, where you say, oh, it's just a normalizing constant. We'll ignore it. Uh, and Usually that hides actually a lot of reasoning, right? So it's okay to do that, and even a good idea to do that in a lot of cases. But you can come up with other cases where the normalizing constant has all of the useful information in it. And so throwing it away you know, prevents you from solving the problem. So just because I wave my hands and say it's a normalizing constant, you know, it goes away, um, don't necessarily do that yourselves, right? It takes a lot of practice to wave your hands that way. All right, so uh, that's the sum version of the Bayes rule. So Bayes' rule in machine learning, right? So, oh, go ahead, question? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, so it's, it's only, this is true no matter what n is, but it's only a practical way to do computation if you don't have a loop for i equals 1 to 27 billion, right? Um, so it, it's sort of, you know, how fast is your computer? Then that's how large n can be. Okay. That's the answer to a lot of questions in machine learning, unfortunately. How fast is your computer? Um, all right. So Bayes' rule in machine learning. So A and B were abstract events so far. But in machine learning, the most important uh, place that we're going to use Bayes' rule is when we're uh, when our events are events about the model that we're interested in inferring or about the data that we see, right? So let's say model is an event that some particular model uh, is the true one, the one true model that explains the data. And then data is the event that I observed a particular data set, right? I can write with Bayes' rule, probability of model given data is the probability of data given model times the probability of model divided by the probability of the data, right? And so the important thing about this is um, probability of data given model, that's basically the definition of a model is something that can tell you the probability of data given itself, right? So by assumption, when we're doing modeling, we have this. Probability of model, this is called the prior. Um, it causes a lot of arguments, but it's not actually hard to write a halfway reasonable one. And a lot of people just, you know, pull one out of their heads and say they're done. 
So we're going to say that's not a problem. The probability of the data, that's annoying, right? Because usually there's not a moderate number of different uh, data events that you could observe, right? So for example, one sort of data would be a list of the heights of everybody in this classroom, right? And so that's going to be uh, you know, a 100-dimensional real-valued vector. And there are a lot of such vectors, right? So um, a lot of machine learning is going to be about how to finesse the problem that we don't, uh, we don't know the probability of data, and then the sum trick doesn't necessarily work from the previous slide. OK? So um, there, just as a preview, some of the things that people do is they approximate that sum, or in, it can be an integral if there are infinitely many. So you can do numerical integration to get an, an estimate of what that interval is. Uh, there are randomized methods like Markov chain Monte Carlo, which we'll mention in, uh, in a while, uh, which let you approximate the integral. Uh, and then we're going to um, very quickly get to, uh, get to another idea for that. All right, so this is kind of why, uh, this is kind of why Bayes' rule uh, appears in the first few lectures of a machine learning class, right? Uh, it lets you um, get the thing you want, the probability of the model, after you condition on what you observe, given some things that you have and something that you can usually finesse or often finesse. Okay? So um, one of the ways that you can uh, finesse it is suppose that I want to approximate this, right? So this is equal to, um, I'll just write it out, right? This is equal to the probability of uh, data given model times probability of model uh, divided by the integral uh, of p of data uh, given model, uh, we'll say model prime, right? Because it's not, this is, is going to be an integral ranging over all possible models we could have. p of model prime d model prime, right? And so uh, what's going to happen? Well, uh, the models for which this thing is high are going to wind up taking the lion's share of this, of this uh, normalized, right? So I'm taking this and normalizing it. And so the things that were high are still going to be high. I'm dividing everything by the same normalizing constant. And so one thing that we could do is just pretend that the only thing that has uh, significant mass after I normalize is the model for which uh, this thing is highest, right? So that's a pretty horrible approximation to an integral, uh, but we could do it. And so um, what we can do is then uh, do approximate inference by saying uh, max over model uh, p of data given model p of model, right? And uh, then this denominator really doesn't matter, right? It really is just a normalizing constant because if you're doing a maximization, well, this whole thing goes away, right? It doesn't, you're multiplying everything by the same number. It's a positive number, so it doesn't change the order uh, of what's the largest, okay? And this is called uh, MAP, maximum a posteriori estimation. Uh, and it seems like a horrible approximation if you happen to be uh, a Bayesian, but it turns out that there's actually plenty of theory to back it up. Uh, and we may get into some of that theory later. An even more horrible approximation, again from a Bayesian perspective, is just to cross out that term. Say P of model, eh, it's hard to come up with a prior, I'm just going to drop it, or pretend it's uniform or something like that, right? And so what that does uh, is it gives you something uh, called maximum likelihood estimation, right? So the likelihood is just the data given model. Maximum likelihood is picking the model with the maximum likelihood, unsurprisingly. Uh, and 
again, it seems like a very horrible thing to do if you happen to be a Bayesian, but there is actually a lot of theory saying it's, it's uh, in many cases a great thing to do. And you can think of it like one intuition for why it's a, a decent idea is that uh, if you have a lot of evidence so that this posterior distribution of the model given the data is very peaked, right? There's only one or a few models that are likely after the data. Uh, then doing this sort of approximation where you just pick the most, uh, the, the most likely one is um, you know, maybe not such a bad idea. All right. So any questions so far on this part of the lecture? Yeah. If, if you had, though, say, two or three models that had a high value for that, wouldn't just picking the highest give you a, a Right, so if you just have two or three models that are, are reasonably high, then what you can do is pick those two or three models and use the sum trick to get a distribution that's normalized over them. And that's actually, um, there are a lot of tricks for getting a random sample of models which have fairly high probabilities so that you can then do that normalization. Uh, and that's actually, uh, if you're a Bayesian, a much better thing to do than just picking the most, uh, the, the most likely. Right? If you happen to not believe in priors, then there's no point in trying to compute this integral accurately. Uh, other questions? All right, so frequentist versus Bayes. Three, two, one, fight, right? So this is something you hear a lot about. Um, and in fact, they're both right in some sense. So you know, I hate to I hate to be a buzzkill and not have a you know big epic battle between the frequentists and the Bayesians, uh, but it's basically just a different way of looking at a lot of the same things. It's not like frequentists never use Bayes' rule, uh, and it's not like Bayesians never use frequentist techniques. Uh, so you know, even if you got Jersey Neyman, a famous frequentist, in the same rule as the Reverend Thomas Bayes. Uh, in the same room as the Reverend Thomas Bayes, who's, who Bayes' rule is named after, they probably wouldn't have an epic battle. They'd probably find a lot to talk about. Um, there are a couple of, di of, of uh, uh, differences that are sort of characteristic of these two different points of view. Um, one is, do you think of nature as a probability distribution? Right? There's some, uh, you know, the way, uh, the way the model happens. I'm trying to find the model, right? And nature went out and rolled some dice or, you know, uh, picked a ball out of an urn or whatever it is that probabilists like to do and uh, picked a model that way, right? Uh, so if you believe that, then that's Bayesian. On the other hand, if you think, okay, nature's mean. It's going to go and pick a model to try and make me look dumb. Uh, I'm going to try and design inference rules that minimize the possibility of my looking dumb, right? Which is often a pretty good thing to do if some, you know, rich client has hired you to do statistics for them, right? You minimize the possibility that you're going to look dumb. So if, you, if, you, uh, if that's the way that you think about the world, then that's more frequentist. And they're both valid ways, right? Um, the, uh, the other way of, of thinking about the distinction is that... Um, a frequentist way of thinking about probability is the long-run frequency of repeatable events, right? So I, uh, you know, throw darts at a checkerboard, or I, you know, uh, play roulette for a while, and I ask, how often does red come up on the roulette wheel? So that's one definition of probability. The other definition of probability is, well, you know, I'd be willing to take two to one odds on red coming up on a roulette wheel. I wouldn't be willing to, you know, um, uh, uh, take odds that are worse for me than that. And if the casino is willing to pay me 10 to 1 on a bet on red, I'm taking it right away, uh, unless maybe I believe the casino is crooked. Right? That's, uh, you always have to worry about that. Um, so those two, those two definitions, they're, they're both valid ways of thinking about probability, but they lead to sort of very different sets of axioms, uh, ways of reasoning about it. And one is more frequent as the other is more Bayesian. Um, maybe one last way of telling the difference, right? So the Bayesian is if you have the right distribution over models and you can do your computation with it, good things are going to happen, right? And that's true. And the frequentist comes along and says, but both having the right distribution over models and being able to compute with it are pretty horrible assumptions, right? And so you might as well try and be a little bit worst case about the stuff that you're having trouble uh, modeling, okay? Uh, and if you want even more, there's a link to a nice XKCD cartoon on the side of the slide. 
Uh, if people giggle over the next two, uh, two slides, I'll know people are clicking on it uh, on their laptops. All right, um, so let's do some work with Bayes' rule. So there's, uh, there's a rare and horrible disease. Let's call it Gordon's syndrome, okay? Uh, about a tenth of a percent of all people are, are infected with it. Um, we have a test for this disease, luckily, uh, and hopefully a treatment too, but let's just think about the test for now. Uh, the test is great in the sense that it detects every single infection, and it's very highly specific. It only has a 1% false positive rate. So you come to the doctor, he gives you the test for Gordon syndrome, you test positive. Uh, bad news, right? How many people think that the uh, probability that you have Gordon syndrome after this test is, um, let's go with, uh, I'll, I'll break it into four, uh, four categories, near 100%, uh, about two thirds, Okay, we have a few votes for that. About one third, all right, and near zero. Ah, okay, so people have seen this example before. So the probability is in fact near zero. Um, let's actually use Bayes' rule to go and uh, convince ourselves of that, right? So we have, um, we have several things, right? So we know this is P of uh, disease, right? Um, this is, probability of a positive result on the test, given that you have the disease, which I'll just write D, right? And then this here is the probability that you uh, get a positive result on the test, given that you uh, do not have the disease, right? And so these are some of the things that you would need for Bayes' rule. So let's just go and write it out, right? So P of disease, given the test is positive, right? Um, this is equal to probability of positive given uh, that you have the disease times the probability of the disease divided by uh, the sum, right? So P of plus given uh, D, P of D, right? Plus P of plus given not D, P of not D, right? And so we can just write that out. Uh, P of uh, plus given the disease uh, is one, right? Uh, times the probability of the disease, 0 0.001, right? Divided by one times 0 0.001, which is 0 0.001, plus, and then plus given not the disease, uh, that's 0 0.01, right? And probability of the not, not the disease is 0 0.999, right? And if you work this out, this is equal to, uh, well, I'll write approximately equal to, because I have finite precision slides, uh, 0 0.091. Okay, so it's closer to zero than it is to anything else. Even though you had a great test and, you, um, uh, and the test turned out positive, right? And the reason is that this prior here, the fact that the um, disease is so rare in the general population overwhelms even quite a good test, right? So a bonus question, what's the probability that your average med student gets this question wrong? Um, Somebody actually did this study. I don't remember what it was, but it was, you know, scarily high, 50% or something like that. Uh, all right, so um, now let's say, whoops. Let's say we are even better. We have a follow-up test, right? So we have a different test, uh, maybe done by a different lab using a different methodology. This one is not quite as good a test. That's why we didn't give it to you the first time. It de detects 90% of infections and has 5% false positives, right? And you take it, and let's say you're positive on that too, right? So two different tests for Gordon syndrome, you, 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 you test uh, positive on both of them, right? So we can now uh, write that out uh, again using Bayes' rule, right? So this is uh, probability of uh, plus one and plus two, right? That's the two tests uh, given the disease times the probability of the disease divided by uh, P of plus one plus two given disease, P of disease uh, plus P of plus one and plus two given not the disease, not the disease times probability of not the disease, right? 
Uh, OK, so now probability of plus 1 and uh, 2 given the disease. Well, um, so that's going to be uh, probability of plus 1 given the disease, uh, probability of plus 2 given the disease times the probability of the disease uh, divided by the same thing, right? So uh, uh, write that down, plus 1 given the disease, probability of plus 2 given the disease. P of disease plus P of plus 1 given not the disease, P of plus 2 given not the disease, and probability of not the disease, right? Uh, and if we, I'm not going to, uh, we know all of these quantities, right? We knew this, the stuff for test 1 from the previous slide. This one is uh, P of plus 2 given uh, the disease, right? And this is P of uh, minus two, uh, sorry, plus two given not the disease, right? So, um, so we know all of these quantities. We can work it out. This is now about 0.643, right? And again, that's approximate. That's what MATLAB told me, okay? So, test two doesn't seem as good as test one. Why didn't we just give you test one again? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So the answer he said was you need independence, right? And so I snuck one by you, maybe, right? I just wrote this formula for the probability of plus one plus two given the disease as being this product, right? And that's actually false in general, right? It could be, for example, if both tests are given in the same lab. And that lab's been contaminated with, uh, you know, the scary microbe that causes Gordon syndrome. Then they, you know, they both come out plus, and that's correlated, right? So this would be false in general, but it's true if you assume that the two tests are independent, right? And the reason we don't give uh, test one over and over again is that, well, the test one has some inner workings that we don't understand, but we believe that uh, you know, there's more than one cause of it coming up positive. One could be just, you know, I don't know, if you ate poppy seeds for breakfast that morning, it's going to come up uh, positive, right? have false positives. So it's not going to be independent, and it's not going to give us uh, new information, and so it's not going to change our posterior probability of you having the disease. Okay. So um, independence, right? So we just sort of gave the uh, the definition of independence, right? So for events A and B, probability of A and B uh, is equal to probability of A times the probability of B, right? And that is the definition of independence for events. Okay, so just the idea that you can take this product of the joint thing and replace it by uh, the product of the marginals, right? That's uh, that's the definition of independence. And an example on our favorite checkerboard here, right, would be if we have rows, uh, columns, and rows of this checkerboard, right? So the probability of a row is one sixth. The probability of a column is 1 6, and the probability of this square is 1 over 36. The product is those two, right? And an example of something that isn't independent, right, would be, um, let's say, this row and then this square, right? So the product of the square is uh, 4 over, the, the probability of the square is 4 over 36, right, which is 1 9th. Uh, and then the probability here, um, uh, let's, let's, just make sh let's just make a little bit sure. Let's make it like this. The probability is now 5 over 36, which doesn't simplify. Um, right? And then the, the joint probability is 2 over 36, which is not equal to the product of those probabilities. Okay? And uh, what we actually had was not just independence of the test, because the two tests are obviously not independent. If you have Gordon syndrome, you're more likely to test positive on both. So their, uh, their joint probability is not equal to the product of their marginals. But what conditional independence is, uh, so conditional independence is written that uh, a, a random variable or an event x is independent of 
a uh, random variable or event y given some other one z, right? Um, I guess I should say, by the way, that uh, plain independence is just written x is independent of y, right? Uh, so conditional independence just means that uh, for every outcome z, right, we have that uh, the uh, x is independent of y conditioned on that outcome. So the conditional probability distribution is, is independent, meaning that the probability of x and y, uh, sorry, probability of x and y uh, given that outcome z is equal to the probability of x given z times the probability of y given z. Okay? Oh, and I should say, by the way, that this here, right, the data type of this statement, uh, we have a, um, uh, right, so here, right, we have three different random variables. And we're talking about the probability, uh, something that depends on the outcomes of all three of them. So this is a statement about a three-dimensional table, right? So for every possible outcome of this, the resulting joint distribution, that's a two-dimensional table on x and y, is equal to the product of its marginals, the product of two one-dimensional tables. Okay? So uh, here's a nice example of why it's important to reason about conditional independence. There was a study a while ago uh, that showed a significant positive correlation between drivers wearing coats and having an accident in their car, right? And the study concluded, well, coats hinder your movement. Maybe you can't reach for the shift, gear, shift lever or the brake as well, right? And so they proposed a new law that would prohibit people from wearing coats while they're driving. Uh, and then somebody pointed out, right, people wear coats when it rains. So that's, uh, you, you really have to think of possible causes of, uh, right, uh, of, uh, uh, independence, conditional independence, right? So there was a dependence marginally between these two, but once you condition on whether it's raining or not, the dependence goes away. And that tells you something about policy, right? Uh, you know, correlation doesn't imply causation, but lack of correlation probably, you know, tells you you shouldn't be making a law, okay? And a little bit more on the importance of conditioning. All right, so um, that's basically the end of the uh, material on uh, probability. So now would be a good time if anybody has questions about any slide up to now in this lecture or anything that I talked about in the last lecture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, qu the question is, in Bayes' rule, you have uh, A and B that are uh, events or random variables. And can they be, does it matter whether they're discrete or continuous? Uh, and the answer is Bayes' rule holds both for discrete variables and for continuous variables, except in those weird cases that I, that I mentioned, right? So as long as you're not hitting the borel kolmogorov paradox or non-measurable events, then everything is fine. And everything that we've showed, including Bayes' rule, works equally well for discrete and continuous random variables. So for the continuous ones, you're going to be doing it with probability densities. And for the discrete ones, you're going to be doing it with regular macroscopic probabilities. Works with a mixture as well. Uh, you can, you can you know, pick one from column A and one from column B. Any more questions? All right. So. The sort of things that we're going to be doing Bayes' rule on are samples, right? So uh, we had our checkerboard that I was throwing darts at. Now imagine that I sit there and throw 100 different darts at 100 different checkerboards. Identical darts, identical checkerboards. I'm in the same mood every time, right? So and uh, what I get is what's called an independent, identically distributed sample of my checkerboard, of my random variable, OK? And 
the sample itself, you can think of it as a random variable, right? So uh, I can think of a 2n dimensional hyper checkerboard, uh, for lack of a better phrase, right? Checker cube, checker act, I don't know. Um, anyway, I can think of my, the outcomes of this bigger random variable as being all the possible tuples of data that I could get. And I can talk about a distribution over those tuples of data. And that's going to be a very high dimensional and complicated object, but it is, it, it is going to be a random variable, right? And I want to distinguish the sample, which tells me something about that checkerboard, from what I'll call the population, which is the sort of one true platonic checkerboard that is being instantiated multiple times to get me my sample, right? So, um, right, I'll just write that here. N copies of uh, checkerboard is equal to a sample. Right? And um, so I don't necessarily want to reason about that big high dimensional random variable. So what I'll do is I will compute some function of that big long tuple that reduces it to some manageable amount of information. Uh, for example, I could say, you know, what is the mean of the row index of each of these samples, right? And any function like that is called a statistic, small s. And the goal of statistics, capital S, is to use small s statistics to find out something about the population, right? So we have our sample, which is something we actually observe. The one true platonic checkerboard is sitting out there in Plato space. Uh, and we want to figure out something about this one true checkerboard from what we've actually observed. Okay? So, get back to an actual example of a machine learning problem. This gem showed up in my inbox recently. Um, apparently I won $5,500,000 because my email address was picked at random. Good thing. So uh, this is a classification problem, right? I have features of this email. Uh, and so I'm going to write, you know, I have uh, n emails, which I'm going to say are a sample from the distribution of emails that arrive at my inbox, right? Uh, each one of them uh, I'm going to uh, uh, represent by xi, which is some, uh, some features, uh, whoops, es. Features of email i, right? And so that's going to be an element of, uh, let's say they're binary features. Uh, so it's going to be an element of uh, 0, 1 to the d for some d, right? And I have yi, which is uh, spam or ham, right? Spam or not. And I'll call spam uh, 1 and ham 0, OK? So, uh, and then the goal is to produce a rule which goes from a future email to a decision uh, about whether, I, uh, whether I'm going to want to read that email or not, whether it's spam or ham. Okay? And uh, what features am I going to use? Well, one of the simplest sorts of features, uh, and most common, is what's called the bag of words. So I don't know how many of you have been on the eighth floor of Gates, but we have an actual bag of words hanging in the eighth floor of uh, Gates. Um, these ones, by the way, down here, they fell out of the bag. They're the stop words. <laughs> right. So um, what does that mean, right? So if I, uh, I'm going to take my email and I'm going to reduce it to a big vector, right? And uh, there's going to be, you know, x sub. Uh, Lottery, right? I'll, I'll index the elements of my vector by possible words in my vocabulary. And lottery will be one for this one because the word lottery was in my email. And then I'll have, you know, x sub avocado uh, is equal to zero because the email did not actually happen to mention avocados. Okay? So, given that, uh, what do you do? Well, you can make a ridiculously naive assumption. Right? So uh, we have our document, uh, document i. It has some word in it, j. So j could be avocado. Uh, we have another word in the same document, so same i, uh, different words. So we'll call it k. And we'll say that, that those two random variables are independent. 
given uh, whether the email is uh, spam or not, right? So that's going to be yi. Okay. So uh, this assumption is clearly false, right? So for example, uh, the word CMU is uh, not independent of the word Bayes in my emails, right? Or probably in any of your emails, either marginally or conditioned on YI, right? But, you know, there's false and there's false but useful, and this is false but useful. So we'll make this assumption. And given this naive assumption, we're going to use Bayes' rule, hence the name naive Bayes, uh, and try and figure out what's the probability that a particular email is spam. All right. So before we get into the actual calculation, I wanted to show you what's called a graphical model. Uh, this is, we'll get a lot more about these later, but a graphical model is just a picture that shows you about independence and conditional independence in, your, uh, in the variables, right? So here I have my spam random variable, and what I'm saying is that, uh, well, x1, whether the first word in my vocabulary is in my email message, depends on whether the message is spam or not, right? It's a lot more likely to have lottery in my message if it's a spam. But, Conditioned on, uh, and what that, what that is being shown by is the existence of this arrow from spam into x1. The fact that there are no other arrows into any of these x's says that these x's are all conditionally independent given the spam status of the email. In other words, the distribution, the distribution of all of the x's given spam factors as the product of the distributions of the individual x's given spam. Right? So this is a very simple graphical model. We'll get more complicated ones later, but I wanted to make sure you saw one earlier in the course. The other thing I wanted to show you is that this here, this thing on the right-hand side, is a uh, shorthand for this thing on the left-hand side. So this, this sort of uh, square here with a, um, an index in the bottom corner says just to repeat this portion of the model, right? It's like a macro or a for loop. And uh, this sort of model with a macro in it is generally called a plate model. Okay. So let's go do the calculation, right? So we have probability of, we want to know probability of spam given that it contains all of these words here, right? And so by Bayes' rule, this is equal to um, the probability of email and all of those other things and million, right? Uh, given, whoops. Uh, given spam, right, over uh, that whole thing, right, probability of those same words given spam plus probability of those same words given not spam. Right? So uh, the independence assumption, right, uh, says that we can factor this. Right, that was the definition of the independence assumption, right? So this is going to be equal to uh, P of email given spam, right? So this is not the probability that it's an email, right? It's the probability that it contains the word email in my email, just to be clear, right? Uh, and then that's going to be times the probability of award given spam, right? All the way out to probability of million given spam uh, over that same thing plus probability of email given not spam times all the way out to probability of million given not spam. Okay? What's that? Oh, yes, you're right. Uh, times... Thank you. It's in my notes. It's not in the slide. So times P of spam, right? And then this here is times, so there's a P of spam here as well, uh, hidden in the uh, quotes, and then P of not spam. Thank you. I was doing maximum likelihood. <laughs> All right. So um, Let's suppose that we happen to know all of these conditional probabilities of individual words, given spam and given not spam, 
right? Then this above, this thing up here is actually pretty easy to calculate, right? I have a big table of probabilities. I look up all of the word, all of the words in my email in that table of probabilities, and I just multiply together all of these guys. I multiply together all of these guys. Uh, I sum and you know normalize, right? So it's pretty easy actually to do the calculation. It's just a bunch of, once you've got all of those probabilities, you have a table of probabilities given spam, a table of word probabilities given not spam. You look up the words in the email in both of those tables, multiply them together, and uh, normalize by the sum. Okay? And so now what, what do we do? We keep all of the emails that have probability of spam less than some threshold. How do we pick the threshold? Uh, well, that's really based on user preference, right? You have to trade off uh, the chance of missing my important internet lottery win against my desire to get actual work done, right? So, um, but, so what you do is you just, you know, you, you, uh, you set it per user depending on, uh, you know, how much spare time they have and how credulous they are. Um, okay. Any questions? So you guys could all run out now and implement a naive Bayes classifier? Hint, you might. Uh, so uh, all right then. So let's talk a little bit about how we might actually do the calculation, right? Um, so uh, what I'm going to do is do this calculation in log space, right? So I had all of these conditional probabilities. Uh, and they're probably going to be pretty small numbers, right? The probability of avocado in an email is, I, I, I could actually estimate that by going back and looking at my back emails, but I'm pretty sure it's quite low, right? Um, and so multiplying together a bunch of tiny numbers, you're going to get underflow. So to avoid underflow, we should work in log space. So we'll take the log of each of these, right? There's one for spam, one for not spam. So I'll call them Z spam for the log of that product and Z not spam for the log of that product, right? Uh, and so the result then um, is that uh, P of spam given words, right, is equal to uh, exp of Z spam, right, divided by exp of Z spam plus exp of z sub not spam, right? And so all I've done here is remove the logs and go back to that formula, the sum formula for Bayes' rule, right? The, the um, product of probabilities for the spam divided by the sum of the products for spam and not spam, okay? And uh, well, so let's, uh, let's simplify this a little bit. We can divide both top and bottom here by e to the z spam, right? And that's equal then to 1. The denominator just goes away because you're dividing by it. Uh, and then we divide the, uh, sorry, the numerator goes away because you're just dividing by it. The denominator becomes, well, this is also 1 plus x of, uh, and now I'm going to write minus z where z is equal to uh, z spam minus z not spam, right? And so this function here is an important one. You might recognize it. It's called the logistic function. But what this says is that I calculate some number z, and I put it over this function, 1 over 1 plus e to the minus z, and that gives me my probability. And what this function looks like, right? So it's going to go, you know, here's minus 10, here's plus 10. Uh, and it's going to go from 0 over here. Uh, it'll go up. Uh, it'll be symmetric around the origin. And it'll go up to plus 1 here. And it'll be 0 there, right? So it's this sort of soft step function that says, well, if z is very low, I'm very confident that um, it's not spam. If z is very high, I'm very confident that it's spam. And in the middle, it just goes through this sort of smooth, uh, uh, smooth transition from uh, spam to not spam. Okay. Yes. It's called the logistic function or the sigmoid function. Right. So, uh, and it's sometimes it's sometimes written as uh, logit of z. Right. 
So let's collect terms, right? So here's the definitions from the previous slide. Um, so z is equal to z spam minus z, uh, apparently, z not, uh, not spam, right? This uh, cut and paste error, so ignore that, right? So um, what is that? Well, OK, so this is equal to, I'm going to take this log of a product and turn it into a sum. Right? So I have a bunch of sums of log probabilities. There's uh, this one sort of unconditional thing. right? And so that's going to be uh, log of p spam. right? And that's going to be positive. And then I'm going to have minus log of p not spam. Right? And I'll call this uh, b. Right? And then I'm going to have. Uh, plus log of p of email given spam, right? Uh, minus log of p of email given not spam, right? And I will call this uh, w sub uh, email. Right? So the difference between the conditional probability of email given spam and email given not spam in log space. Okay? Uh, and then plus the same thing, right, which is going to be, let's say, w sub, uh, w sub award, right? And then uh, w sub lottery, right? That's supposed to be an arrow. Right? And so what do I do? I sum over all words in my message a real number which depends only on that word. Right? The real number is the difference in its log probability depending on whether it's spam or not spam. And uh, then I add a constant, and I test to see whether it's bigger, bigger than a threshold. Right? So I have something that looks like uh, sum over all uh, words in the document j uh, of wj times xij, right? So this is zero for words that aren't in the document. So this is basically a sum over words that are in the document of this w. And, and then I add uh, something that is just a constant, and I check whether it's bigger than some threshold theta. Okay. And so the form of the decision rule is quite simple, right? It's what's called a linear discriminant. Uh, and what a linear discriminant looks like is, uh, right, here's my abstract 10,000-dimensional uh, space where uh, the documents live, right? And I have some documents that are uh, positive, right? These are the spam ones. I have some documents that are uh, negative, right? Maybe they're not perfectly. Uh, separated and a linear discriminant is just a line that goes between them, right? And so here, this is going to be z is uh, greater than or equal to theta, and then here, this is z is less than or equal to theta, right? And the line is called the decision boundary, and the thing as a whole is called a linear discriminant classifier. Okay. So that's naive Bayes in a nutshell. Uh, do I have questions? I'm sorry, in? Yeah, in to collect the spam name, so do we use a nice base rule? Oh, is it, is it actually used in practice? Um, it is used in practice. Um, probably the email fil people have had a lot of time to develop better and better email filters. So probably they started from naive bays and added a whole bunch of complications on, on top of it. Um, but uh, basically, it's one of these things where if you know naive Bayes, that makes you, you know, just dangerous enough to be, you know, to, to hurt something, right? Um, it's a pretty decent way as a first shot for dealing with very high dimensional classification problems like email classification, right? Um, there are actually, I have a, um, a slide several uh, down here, which we'll just go to now because you asked the question. Um, there are a bunch of improvements that you could make to naive Bayes. Right? There's actually a lot of improvements you could make to naive Bayes. Um, 
what I was going to do is ask for audience suggestions about uh, ways that you can think of to make it better. So do we, do we, have, uh, do we have thoughts? Yeah. Smoothing. Smoothing what? Oh, right. Right. Yes, that's actually something I'm going to have a slide on in a little while. So uh, be better ways to estimate the probabilities, right, <clears throat> is maybe a way to say that. <clears throat> you can do actually even more complicated things like that. So you can do something uh, that's called back-off smoothing instead of just plain smoothing. What back-off smoothing is, uh, is you try and, if you haven't seen a word before, you'll estimate its probability based on probabilities of other similar words. Right, so what does similar mean? For example, same part of speech, or uh, you know, similar spellings, right? And so uh, you can do better at estimating the probabilities of individual words. That's a good suggestion. Other suggestions? Uh, right, we're talking about improving naive bays, not just uh, not. Machine learning in general or spam filtering in general, but ways to improve naive Bayes. So I guess I will uh, write that uh, to naive Bayes. Right, and then the first one was uh, better probability. Uh, and uh, yeah, we have another. Yes, so the, the suggestion was not to use only single words at a time, but to use multiple words at a time. So that's called an n-gram. If you have n words together, like United States of America is four words together, so it's a four-gram, right? So uh, definitely using n-grams will improve naive Bayes. Exactly, looking for spam where the actual dependence on the words may be greater. For example, lottery and win are probably always going to be together in spam, whereas they're not going to be together in a general email. That's right. So, how does that affect that? so um, if you uh, if you use the bigram win lottery, right, then the class conditional probability of win lottery is going to be higher in spam than it is in not spam. So this is exactly. Uh, your, your, your point there is exactly what's helped by using n-grams. Uh, any, any more? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so use data of multiple types. Uh, what types are you thinking? Routing data, yeah, like the headers in the email. That's, uh, that's a good point. So uh, use uh, headers, not just body. There's another, uh, what about different words in the body, right? Does that seem like a good idea as well? So for example, if you have bold words, maybe they have a different distribution than italic or ordinary font words, right? Or uh, you might have a different distribution near the beginning versus near the end of the message, right? So, uh, you know, um, word, uh, let's say location, or the role of the word in the message, right? So if you have a message where you have a header and then like a section header and then a uh, body of the section, maybe the words in the section header mean something different. Or maybe link texts mean something different than, than ordinary text. Uh, more, more suggestions? So, um, I have a few more. Uh, I, wrote, uh, I wrote a bunch, right? So there's uh, named entity recognition. So for somebody who has a common name, right? Uh, you know, let's say uh, Bill Gates, right? Bill and Gates are both common words, but if they appear next to each other, that means something, and you can recognize the named entity. And that's something different than just bigrams, right? Because you're getting a special subset of the bigrams. You're getting the ones that actually you know refer to, to people. And so you can have a feature for named, named entities. You can do part of speech tagging, right? 
Uh, you could run the thing through uh, a robust parser and say that the words that play different roles in the sentence have different, uh, different probabilities. Um, you could do collaborative spam filtering, right? If everybody at uh, the CMU SCS simultaneously won the email lottery, the chance of spam skyrockets, right? Um, you know, one of you might win an email lottery. I, I'm not, not going to bet on it. But the chance of everybody doing it at the same time, that happens a lot under the spam scenario and not so much under the lottery scenario. Uh, you can have white lists or black lists of domains, right? So that's an additional feature uh, where somebody has gone through and curated a list of domains that send a lot of spam. Um, and what this, I think, drives home is that one of the most important things uh, uh, in machine learning is not necessarily knowing fancy algorithms or fancy theorems. It's thinking of the sources of information that you want to go into your, into your machine learning problem and knowing how to go from knowing those sources of information to an actual machine learning algorithm that uses those, source, those sources of information well. Right? So it doesn't have to be a fancy algorithm as long as you have a really good source of information. Okay. Yeah. In, in doing this filtering, how do you encode for things, for example, saying looking for information that's not you, for example, your mail? Mm -hmm. You're getting mail, and if your name's not in there, you want a higher, it's a higher probability that it's spam. How do you encode for things? Right. So um, the same thing is true for words, right? There are words that are not in the current email. The question is, how do you encode features for things that are not in the email? And so in general, what you do is you have a, a huge sparse feature vector, right? So you'll have features for every possible word in the language, and you'll only turn on the features for the words that are in your email. Or you'll have a feature for whether my name uh, you know, whether my name matches one of the addresses in the to list or whether it was just delivered to me, you know, from some uh, unknown source, right? Or whether one of the froms matches somebody who's in my address book, right? You could have features like that, and they'll just be one or zero, right? And typically, when you handle a large sparse feature vector, the best thing to do is just list the things that are on. You don't explicitly list the things that are off. And you'll have weights for the things that are off or on. And you'll sum together only the ones for the ones that are on. Right? And then if you want a weight for a particular feature being off, well, you can add that to the constant. Right? So you can say, well, I'll give it a penalty unless I have my, name ma uh, my address book match one of the, fr uh, the froms. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So that that's similar to the bigrams, the n-grams idea, right? Oh, right. So you could have you could have separated n-grams, right? So you could have tuples of words that appear together in the message, but not right next to each other. Right, and so I'll 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 split n grams into two pieces. Right, that could be together or not. Right, and both of those are good ideas. Um, in general, uh, you can look at something that's actually even more finely graded, which is what's called edit distance. So you can say how many. Uh, insertions, deletions, transpositions of words do I need to go from one string to another, right? And so there, if I saw you won the lottery in one message and lottery, you won in another message, right? Those would be close to, close to each other in edit distance, right? Uh, because they, they don't need very many edits to, to get from one to the other. Yeah. Right, right. So you could just do naive Bayes with you know, features like the word avocado appears in the header and a separate feature for the word avocado appears in the body. Uh, and that's what naive Bayes says to do. But your idea of uh, sort of doing it separately for the headers and the body and then combining them somehow is a good one. And the reason it's a good one is that sort of the degree to which the, the independence assumption might be violated 
uh, is different in different parts of the message. And so you could do the calculation and use some hack to combine the, the different scores that you get from different parts of the message. So it is a good idea, but it requires a little bit more, uh, uh, a little bit more of uh, thought on what exactly is the algorithm to figure out how to combine them. Cool. All right, so I think that's, uh, uh, that's a good discussion about naive Bayes. Um, let's uh, go back to here and say, uh, well, are there any questions about parts of this lecture or you know, basic probability um, other than what we've just had a, a nice long discussion about? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, uh, actually, this naive Bayes is a good example. Um, the, the normalizing constant winds up being an estimate of the probability of seeing that document, right? So it's supposed to be, uh, right, um, we'll go back to one of the slides that has uh, Bayes' rule in it, the non sum form. Right, so, so here, right? Uh, P of model given data is P of data given model, P of model divided by P of data. You might be interested in knowing the probability of your data, right? And so the normalizing constant is exactly that. And if you compute it by some sort of sum or integral, uh, then you get to be able to do something like novelty detection, right? This was really improbable data under my model. Uh, so maybe I ought to raise a flag and ask somebody, you know, why is this uh, crazy message coming my way, right? You know, maybe it happens to be a message in uh, Russian, right? And I don't usually get emails in Russian. And so it's, it's something interesting that maybe I should flag. Cool. Um, all right, so um, a few more intuitions about this. So, First, a word of warning. Um, Naive Bayes tells you that it's calculating the, thing, calculating the probability that this message is spam, right? And so it gives you a number between 0 and 1, or at least it claims it does. But really, most of the time, it gives you 0 to 5 significant figures, or it gives you 1 to 5 significant figures. And it's not actually that confident, right? It doesn't know with 5 nine certainty that this message is spam. Maybe I did actually win the lottery, right? Um, and so can anybody guess the reason for that failure? Uh, any, any thoughts about um, what could have gone wrong in our probability calculation? Yeah. Right. Right. So, so there's there's a lot of small numbers involved. That's part of the problem. Um, and then there's you know we combine them somehow, right? And in order to combine them, we made an assumption, right? What assumption was that? Independence. Independence right. Everybody remembers our assumption. That's good. Um, that independence, I said, was false. Right? And I think that you all probably agree that independence is false, that my, my emails are not word salad. Maybe the emails I send are, but the ones I receive typically have at least some content in them. Um, so the, um, uh, this is how the failure of that, of that assumption plays out in practice. Right? So uh, what you're doing is when you combine two things and assume they're, indep uh, assume they're independent, but they actually aren't, they actually have some positive correlation, then you get a more extreme probability than you should. Right? You get a falsely confident uh, answer. And so the failure of the assumption leads to uh, the learning algorithm telling you an estimate of its confidence, which is actually wrong. And this is actually a pretty common scenario. We make some assumptions, and they lead to uh, bad estimates of how confident the algorithm actually is. Yeah? Um, so could I actually work out a simple example? The problem is that the examples involve very small numbers, right? And it also involves like comparing multiple things, right? So, so what, what will happen is that um, like the way the example would look is you would have, uh, 
let's say, you know, a bunch of words that indicate spam, but a bunch of words that indicate content, right? So I actually re recently got an email about a phishing scam, right? And the email was from the security people, right? But it quoted the spam email inside the security email, right? And so it had features of a good email and features of a bad email. And what would happen is that really it probably should just be unsure about that message. But it's going to wind up summing up a bunch of fairly uh, you know, large numbers, logs of things that are close to zero, uh, right? And, you know, in different directions. And if they happen to cancel out, it will be unsure. But what's more likely is that they won't quite cancel out. I'll get something like plus or minus 10, which is not that big a number, but logitive plus 10 is almost one and logitive minus 10 is almost zero, right? So that's the story of the example, but I don't think I can work out a numerical example on the slide. Okay. So uh, just so that goes on the tape, right, uh, there were people who learned to defeat naive Bayes spam filtering by including content-looking words at the beginning and end of the message, or by hiding, in fact, the spam-looking words, right, like spelling lottery with a zero instead of the O. You know, a dumb naive Bayes filter will think that's a different word and that it doesn't indicate spam, right? And I'm sure you've seen misspelled pharmaceuticals in your emails at some time or another. Uh, all right, so um, the fix for this is if you actually want an estimate of the, um, of the confidence of the naive Bayes, you do, instead of, uh, instead of just logit of z, you do logit of epsilon times z for some small epsilon. And you figure out epsilon using some kind of a hack or maybe by cross-validation. Right? Um, another bit of intuition is, okay, what gives you really highly useful or really highly discriminative words, right? What's, if you look at the form of the naive Bayes uh, classifier, what's going to have a big effect on, uh, on the performance, on the outcome? So I'm summing together a bunch of terms. There's one term per word. So the big ones are going to have a larger influence on the outcome than the small ones. Maybe it was too obvious a thing. Nobody was willing to say something like that. Uh, but the big, the big numbers, right, are going to have a larger influence on what the classification is, right? If I, if I have a word like lottery that has a very, you know, small probability in true emails, you're going to get log of something close to zero, and it's going to really influence the classification because log of something close to zero is a very uh, big number, right? And uh, so the ones, um, the ones that are going to influence the classification a lot on average are the big numbers that occur often, right? So if I have a word such that uh, P of word is relatively large, uh, right, and the difference uh, log P of word given spam minus log P of word uh, whoops, given not spam, right? So if both of those two numbers are large, I'm going to have more of, an, uh, more of an influence. And so one measure of the expected influence is just to multiply those, wor those numbers together. And this is kind of a nice looking thing because it's sort of an information theoretic looking quantity, right? It's you know, some distribution times the log of some distribution. Um, and I'm not going to go any farther into that, but just, you know, that's a good way of sort of estimating which are the best words. And so if you had to, for example, cut, cut down your probability, your table of probabilities and ship something that ran on, you know, a tiny embedded device, what you'd do is you'd keep the coefficients that had the largest value of that, uh, of that index. Okay? And so... Um, 
what you want is words that actually have a chance of appearing, but that have very different chances of appearing in spam and not spam. All right, and then just briefly before we go, how do we get the probabilities? Uh, you've probably already guessed this, but we get the probabilities by going back and looking at a sample, right? So if we have uh, a coin flip, right, and we get three heads and seven tails, right, we're going we're gonna to go and say that it's three tenths, right? Three over three plus seven is the probability of heads, right? Um, now, can anybody see a problem with this way of doing things? Too, too few examples was, yes. So suppose that I have uh, zero heads and two tails, right? That's going to give us uh, zero over two equals zero. And we say heads are 100% impossible given our two samples, right? Which seems like maybe a little bit risky of a conclusion. And so um, what we actually do, right, and uh, a hack that you could imagine is say number of heads plus a half over number of heads plus number of tails plus one, right? So we add a half to both of our counts so that we add one to the denominator, right? And this seems like a horrible hack, but it actually has some, uh, has some theory behind it. It turns out to be the maximum a posteriori, the map estimate of the probability given a Dirichlet distribution prior. And we'll talk about that sort of thing more. Um, and these numbers, right, they could be any epsilon here and then epsilon times the number of possible outcomes here. Yes? So that actually turns out that the specific choice of numbers that you pick, the one half of one, called the Krzyzewski proximal estimator, you can show that this is actually the optimal choice for binary being an information driven decision. Okay. So it has a name and it has a theorem. Yeah. <laughs> um, Right, and so uh, how, does this, how does this play out in Naive Bayes, right? So if you see a word in your new email, let's say somebody writes you about the upcoming syzygy, the conjunct conjunction of planets, right, between, you know, let's say, I don't know, Mars and Jupiter are going to be aligned and the world's going to end, right? And you didn't happen to see syzygy anywhere in your training set, right? What you're going to do, Naive Bayes tells you to take the log of zero. If your probability estimate is zero, you get not a number, you crash your computer, bad things happen. Right? So what this does is it just makes it a really small number, and it'll actually be the same number in both spam and not spam, and it'll totally cancel out. Right? So this sort of smoothing is a good idea. I think somebody actually mentioned it, and it's even better to do even smarter smoothing. Uh, all right, I think uh, that's all the time we have for today. So I'll uh, see you next time.